Good morning, folks. Welcome back. Hope everybody's doing okay. Hope nobody's in the classroom. Maybe they are. They can tune in from there if they want. Um, so we got a test on Friday. Uh, the test on Friday will take up the whole class time. Um, so we're not going to, you know, also have class. And uh, it's going to be about everything. So uh, I will talk more in detail uh, tomorrow about the test. But just, just for, your, uh, for your amusement right now, I'll just say, um, let's say this covers everything through the um, inverse trig functions. So no hyperbolic functions which is what we started on last time. All right. Um, but everything else uh, will be on the test. Um, and t tomorrow, I think I would like to just do some review problems. Um, so if you have like particular questions, maybe maybe we could wait until tomorrow. Although we could talk about uh, anything today. Um, uh, people have been asking me about like exactly what formulas do we need to have memorized, especially concerning the inverse trig functions? Do we need to memorize all the derivatives or everything? And um, my plan is, uh, I will tell you tomorrow more specifically, I'll, I'll try and make a big list of everything that you might want to have memorized. And then um, any additional formulas, uh, I would expect, or um, I will just give you a, a big list of formulas to use on the test um, if... Uh, if for some reason I, I want you to use something else, um, it'll be given to you. All right. In general, I don't like memorizing lots of obscure formulas, so the ones to memorize uh, hopefully will be not so many. Anybody got questions at this point? Or we, we will talk much more about it tomorrow. All right, great. Uh, so I would like to do more, uh, you know, more new stuff today, which will not appear on the test, uh, not this test at least. Um, we were talking last time about the hyperbolic trig functions. They are cinch and cosh, and I hope you remember these definitions. Eventually, I will say you should memorize these, although they're not going to be on the test this week. Easy enough, I think. Cinch and Kosh. The difference uh, between them is the plus versus the minus in the numerator. Otherwise, they are the same as each other. And what I would like to talk about, um, you know, last time we didn't say all that much about these. We said that the uh, the graph of Kosh is the one which is sort of most interesting in the real world. It looks kind of like that, uh, but it's not a parabola, and it's also not a hyperbola, even though it looks kind of like either of those shapes. The shape is called a catenary, and um, catenary is the, uh, uh, it occurs in nature. It's the shape of a hanging rope. Um, I, I suppose rope, do ro does that count as occurring in nature? Um, ropes don't really occur in nature, but um, like a hanging spider web or something has the same, that's like a rope. Um, like a what? A vine, yeah, yeah. A vine, right? Like a cartoony vine. I don't know if, if there are real vines that hang like that, but um, yeah, a vine. Uh, there's something, um, it also occurs, I, I believe that the shape of ocean waves in some sense involves catenary-like things because that this, this uh, part of that shape um, is also somehow, it, it sags here because there's sort of tension in the um, surface tension on the water or something. Um, I think that the anything which involves sort of things which are hanging according to gravity, but also in some sort of tension which is holding them up on the two ends, uh, will make a catenary type shape. Okay, um, what I would like to talk about today is why these are called trig functions. So why are they similar at all to the ordinary sine and cosine, right? Because when you look at these formulas, those don't obviously have anything to do with sine or cosine. When you look at the graphs, 
they look like this, which doesn't look at all like sine and cosine. So why would anybody ever even think to call these the hyperbolic sine and the hyperbolic cosine? What do, what do they at all have to do with the ordinary sine and cosine? There are some deep relationships between them um, that uh, I want to talk about today. Maybe I'll say one thing just at the very beginning, which we are really not going to get into this viewpoint much at all, but other, I'm going to say these are kind of like magical formulas for sine and cosine. These formulas were discovered in the, I believe the 1700s, maybe, maybe 16, maybe even earlier. But anyway, here's a formula for sine and cosine that you may have never seen before. I don't know. It turns out this is a true fact about sine of x. Sine of x equals e to the ix minus e to the minus ix over 2, where i is the square root of uh, negative 1. You ever heard of the, the imaginary number i? Um, this is a true fact about sine of x. This is absolutely crazy fact in my opinion. Uh, when you plug a real number in here, even though you're plugging this into these imaginary numbers inside the exponents, it turns out by sort of magical reasons this ends up being a real number. And what you get is the same as the answer for sine of x. And a similar formula for cosine of x. It's this, e to the ix plus e to the i, uh, e to the minus ix over 2. And you can see immediately these look the same as the cinch and the cosh formulas, right? The cinch formula is the same but without the i's, right? That's the cinch and the cosh is... Um, this one, e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2, all right? So this is one way in which people people who are aware of these other weird formulas for sine and cosine, when you, when you put it this way, they actually do look quite similar, even though their behaviors as functions are totally different um, from the point of view of the graph or whatever. Uh, if, you, if you already know these formulas, then this is a, a tip-off that there are similarities uh, because these formulas are almost the same for sine x and the cinch of x. But uh, like I said, we're this class we're not really going to get into imaginary numbers much at all. So uh, we're not going to belabor this point any longer than, than that. Um, let's talk about some basic properties of the cinch and the cosh. And we will see that those basic properties actually more and more resemble the properties of sine and cosine. So basic properties of cinch and cosh. Um, we're going to come up with some uh, sort of like a big list of formulas, which I would not expect you to memorize all of these uh, formulas. Uh, although some of them you could easily reproduce if called upon. For example, here's an easy one. What do I get when I do cinch of zero? Of course, the sine of zero is zero. Um, how about cinch of zero? The general theme is the cinch and cosh, they, um, they obey sort of like the same formulas as sine and cosine. We're going to see that. Either the same or maybe slightly different. Anyway, cinch of zero. How will we do that? You can just plug into the definition of cinch. It shall be e to the zero minus e to the minus zero over two, right? And I think we can just work that out. What, what is that? What is e to the zero? You can show me on the fingers if you want. It's 1. The answer is 1. Yeah, anything to the 0 power is 1. So we get 1 minus e to the minus 0. Well, minus 0 is also is 0. So this is 1 minus 1 on top, divided by 2. And we get 0. So cinch of 0 equals 0. Uh, just like sine, right? Sine of 0 equals 0. What about cosh of 0? Same idea, only it's got a plus in the top, right? e to the 0 plus e to the minus 0 over 2. This time, instead of 1 minus 1, we get 1 plus 1 over 2, which is 1, right? And so cosh of 0 is 1. So I will just summarize this. Cinch of 0 is 0. Cosh of 0 is 1. And I will just say this is just like sine and cosine, right? Sine of 0 is 0. Cosine of 0 is 1. So at least uh, this is a similarity between cinch and cosh and sine and cosine. 
All right. Now, we also, of course, sine and cosine, they also have sort of special behavior when you plug in numbers like pi. There's no, nothing special about cinch of pi or cosh of pi because you get something like e to the power pi, which isn't really anything special. Um, but at least for zero, they, are, they match up. How about this? Um, everybody knows that I want to talk about even versus odd functions. Um, you know, even and odd functions means this, sine of negative x equals negative sine of x. I hope this is familiar. We say this is an even function. Even function means you can factor a minus sign out of it, whereas an odd function is, uh, cosine is an example of an odd function. And remember what that is? Cosine of minus x is... Can you do something with that? When you put a minus x on the inside, in terms of the graph, you can think of this as doing a, a reflection, a horizontal reflection around the y-axis. And the cosine, as you know, is symmetrical around the y-axis, right? So when you flip it around, you get the same thing again. Cosine of minus x is the same as cosine of x. This is called the odd function. Odd function means when you stick a minus sign on the inside, it um, the minus sign just sort of disappears rather than factoring it out, which is what happens on an even function. Uh, on an odd function, it uh, it can go away entirely. All right. Anyway, um, let's talk about let's try and look at cinch and cosh from this point of view. Cinch of minus x cosh of minus x. Maybe I'll let you guys, uh, I'll give you a few moments, see if you can work this out. So what you want to do is plug into the formula for cinch. I'll get this started. It is e, you know, the ordinary formula for cinch is e to the x minus e to the minus x, but I'm plugging minus x instead of x, so what I get is e to the minus x minus e to the minus minus x, right? That's what you get when you plug in negative x to the definition of cinch. Can you somehow See if you can fill in the blanks here and end up with something like cinch again. Because that's I want a formula that, that's kind of like this. I mean, maybe it's not going to be exactly the same, but um, see what you think. I'll give you a few moments. Have you had enough minutes? What'd you get? Anybody want to tell us what uh, what did you end up getting when you did the cinch of minus x? Did anybody get anything? Yeah, if you did it right, I hope you ended up with negative cinch of x. Um, if you, uh, so this one here, you should, of course, like combine those minus signs up there. I get e to the minus x minus e to the x over 2. But then if we factor a negative sign out of that, um, it will switch around the order. So this is the same as minus, come on now, sorry, 
minus like that, right? Factor the minus sign out of there. And that's a cinch right there. So this is minus cinch of x. I hope that's what you uh, what you did. Um, so cinch is an even function, just like sine is. And what about cosh? If you do the same kinds of things for cosh, it says e to the minus x plus e to the minus minus x. This one maybe is a little easier because you don't have to do any weird factoring out of signs. This is just the same as cosh, right? So cosh is an odd function and cinch is an even function. This is the moral of the story here. Just like sine and cosine. All right. The theme, remember, is these cinch and cosh, they have all the same properties. Maybe not all exactly the same, although, you know, so far they have been all exactly the same. Um, more formulas. So here's a few more formulas that you could do in the same way. I don't think we need to go through the details just because it's, it's kind of a lot of uh, a lot of simplifying of uh, fractions involving e to the x and e to the minus x. But anyway, there are addition what formulas. Uh, yeah. So, I have a question? What, what, the, what does knowing if it's an even or odd function tell us? Um, the evens, yeah, this is a great question. The, um, the evens and odds functions, I mean, they have, um, those facts are sometimes useful when you are doing, uh, they, they come up in like obscure times. Uh, for example, if you're, if you want to do something like, I don't know if you've ever done this trick, but how about the integral from minus two to two of, um, sorry, how about cosine of x minus one divided by x squared. Um, this integral, the thing on the inside of the uh, integral sign here is sorry I'm just now realizing I got the I got the evens and odds backwards. Can I can you can you scribble that? The sign is odd. This is just terminology. I mean everything that I wrote was was true but the I I said the wrong words. Uh, sign, when, when you factor the minus sign out, that's called an odd function. The reason is because uh, this the word even versus odd has to do, it comes from this. Minus 1 to the power n, it equals minus 1 if n is odd. And it equals plus 1 if n is even. This is why these are called even versus odd functions. An odd one is one in which the minus sign factors out. An even one is one in which the minus sign just kind of disappears or goes away. It comes from this, um, the power of a negative number. Um, sorry about that. Anyway, in this example, see, I realized that when I put this uh, square down here, I meant, I meant something like a cube. Um, in this example, everything on the inside of this function is an odd function. That is, if you were were to replace x by negative x, um, I messed it up again. I wanted it to be even. Sorry. I'm blowing it this morning. Everything inside here is an even function because cosine is an even function and x squared is also an even function. So this is an even function. It means f of minus x is equal to f of x, right? Um, the minus sign doesn't matter. And what that means in terms of this integral, it means that the, the picture, I don't even know what the picture looks like here, but it is symmetric around the y-axis. Like whatever this function looks like, it, it sort of does, you know, the same thing on both sides, on either side. Um, and what that means is when I do the integral from negative 2 to 2, you know, from here to here, is the same as doing just the right-hand integral, but multiplying it by 2, because the the uh, integral on the right side will be the same as the integral on the left side of the uh, y-axis. So this right here, because it's an even function, you can say this equals 2 times the integral just 
from 0 to 2. Cosine of x minus 1 over x squared. This sometimes allows you to do the integral um, because you change the uh, boundaries. So this trick with an even function, when you integrate across the uh, y-axis, um, the part on the right side is the same as the part on the left side, and so they can combine together um, two times the one-half. That's not terribly useful, but uh, it can be useful if it were uh, an odd function. It's, it's even better. So this is an odd function. That means the um, the curve on the right side is the same as the curve on the left side, but upside down. That's uh, that's what an odd function is. When you when you do this reflection, you get the negative of what you started with. Anyway, that means that the integral is zero, and this is a useful fact sometimes, although somewhat obscure. But it's because um, this is an odd function here, which means the part on the right and the left sides they will be the same, only they will be the opposite of each other, and so you can. Um, you know that the integral from the right half uh, is equal but opposite to the integral on the left half, and you'll get zero for the for the whole thing. Um, another, uh, yeah, another thing that knowing about even versus odd can tell you, um, it can tell you just sort of how to simplify things. If you have minus signs on the inside, um, it's a way of factoring the minus signs out. Uh, which which will allow you to simplify formulas. Anyway, this is a long answer to the question. The answer to the question is basically knowing if a function is even or odd is not is not super important, but it can give you um, a bunch of sort of extra information about the function, which sometimes might be useful. But I will say usually this is kind of a, an obscure fact, um, and I probably you know for our purposes probably not really important to even mention. But I'm trying to. Um, I'm trying to pull out the similarities between sine and cosine and the sinh and cosh, and this is one of the important similarities. Still listening? I know, I know it was a long-winded, <laughs> long-winded answer to the question, um, and, and not not terribly important. Um, but yeah, thank you for the question, though. All right. So I was going to go on uh, another similarity. This also uh, sort of falls under the category of sort of uh, random facts, um, which are not all that important, but another uh, thing which which will point out similarities between sinh and cosh and sine and cosine, and those are addition formulas. This is something that I'm sure you learned in high school, uh, or maybe maybe uh, in your Calc 1 class, addition formulas for sine and cosine. Um, that is to say, there's a formula for sine of you know x plus y. There's some something you can do with that, and this formula is uh, is actually we're not going to use this formula much at all, and I would not expect you to uh, have this formula memorized. But uh, if you do, it's it's sine of x times cosine of y plus cosine of x times sine of y. So there's something kind of cute about that, um, and there's a similar one for cosine. Um, Anyone actually remember this one? You get no prize, but the satisfaction of remembering an obscure trigonometry formula. It's this, sine of x times sine of y plus cosine of x times cosine of y. These are the angle addition formulas for sine and cosine. Not, um, not terribly important, at least as far as this class goes. They're used a lot in certain kinds of geometry, but um, we're not going to make a big deal out of them. But I want to tell you, there are similar formulas for sinh and cosh, and they're not hard to... You could derive these yourself if you wanted to. Sinh of x plus y, what is that? It's e to the x plus y minus e to the minus x plus y over 2, right? And this you can simplify by breaking up e to the x plus y is e to the x times e to the y, right? and then e to the minus, sorry, it, it really needs to have parentheses up there, minus x plus y, which is the same as minus x minus y. You break each of those up, and then you can sort of factor in a weird way and simplify this into some stuff. Can I just say, you do a bunch of steps. I will just tell you what the right answer is. And if you wanted to, you could go through this. I don't think it's worth the time, but um, 
I mean, it's not worth the time right now. Ah. Check it out. You get exactly the same formula. Cinch of x, cosh of y, plus cosh of x, cinch of y. All right. The same formula uh, as the angle addition formula for the sine. Uh, and would you believe it? There is a cosh formula, which again is the same as the cosine. So this the appropriate formula for cosh is uh, cinch x cinch y plus cosh x cosh y. So yet another similarity between the cinch and the cosh and the sine and the cosine. Remember my theme for the morning is why would you ever call them the same things sine and cosine and hyperbolic sine and hyperbolic cosine? It's because even though their definitions are totally different and the, the uh, graphs look totally different, actually a lot of things are totally the same about them. All right. Uh, not quite everything is the same. Here's one very important formula um, that is not quite the same. So we all know sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1. This one is actually super important. In my, uh, from my point of view, the angle addition formulas in trigonometry are kind of obscure. And you probably learned other ones about double angle formulas, triple angle formulas. Those, we don't really use them very much. This one though, sine squared plus cosine squared equals 1. This one we use all the time. Um, and there is a similar one for cinch and cosh, but actually it's not the same. So the one for cinch and cosh, not quite the same, it's similar. But this one is similarly important about cinch and cosh. Uh, and this one you should remember. It is cosh squared x minus cinch squared x equals 1. All right. Instead of a plus, it's a minus. And I wrote them the other way. The, other or the order doesn't matter, right? Cinch, um, I mean, you could have written this original one with cosine squared plus sine squared equals 1. Turns out cos cosh squared minus cinch squared equals 1. I want to go through, actually, how, um, how could you demonstrate this if you really wanted to? It's not hard. You just use the formulas for cosh and cinch. I will start with the left side. Let's see if we can end up with the right side. Cosh squared minus cinch squared. And I want to try and simplify this somehow and eventually end up with 1. That's what we're looking for. Um, how would I do cosh squared? Of course, that means cosh of x times cosh of x. That would be e to the x plus e to the minus x over 2 squared, right? And then minus cinch squared e to the x minus e to the minus x over 2. That's cosh squared minus cinch squared. And what we can do with these is actually square them out, like do the foil thing. Of course, you can square the top and the bottom, right? So this is e to the x plus e to the minus x squared divided by uh, 4, right? If you square on the bottom and then minus e to the x minus e to the minus x squared over 4. Squaring a fraction, same as square the top and also square the bottom. And then here, I said we could do the foil. Would you mind if I just factor one-fourth out of everything? Then we don't have to deal with those denominators. e to the x plus e to the minus x squared minus e to the x minus e to the minus x squared, right? And now, I'm going to do the foil thing. So one-fourth out here. What is e to the x plus e to the minus x squared. That's what I want to do. I'll just sort of do that on the side here. This, of course, is e to the x plus e to the minus x, e to the x plus e to the minus x, right? And I want to multiply that out with the foil. So you do the two first things. It would be e to the x times e to the x on the front. What, uh, anybody remember how to do that? What, what do you get when you do e to the x times e to the x? E to the x times e to the x. How, what do you do inside the exponent there? 
Uh, I heard. Um, the two x. Yeah, you should add the exponents so it becomes e to the two x, e to the x plus x, right? You add the exponents in that situation. Um, maybe I'll just write out the rest of the foil. You get two e to the x times e to the minus x, right? And then you also get um, e to the minus x times e to the minus x, right? Those are all the terms that you get from the foil. Two in the middle because you have the inside and the outside. They add up. Uh, so what you get here is e to the 2x. What's e to the x times e to the minus x in the middle there? Uh, the last one is e to the negative 2x. You should be adding the exponents each time. What about the one in the middle? It's just e to the 0. So. Yeah, e to the 0, because I have, I'm have i going to add the exponents, and they are x and minus x, so you add them up, you get 0. So it's 2 times e to the 0. e to the 0 is 1, so really it's just 2 in the middle there. All right, so in conclusion, over here we get e to the 2x plus 2 plus e to the minus 2x, and then subtract. And here I put the result of the foil from the second one. Now, the, the foil from the second one will be the same, only it's got a negative sign in the middle here. The effect of that is it'll make the middle term of the foil negative instead of positive. So the uh, other part here ends up being e to the 2x minus 2 plus e to the negative 2x, like so. All right, and then when I combine, remember I'm looking for the answer to be one here. So a lot of this stuff will cancel, I think. I have e to the two x here will cancel with this negative e to the two x, and then this e to the negative two x will cancel with this one over here. They both have plus signs in front of them, but here there's a minus which will distribute, uh, and so they do. They really do cancel. And then also this minus sign will distribute to here and make this another plus 2. So what we get is 1 fourth 2 plus 2, right? And that's 1, which is what we wanted. All right. I suppose this is a proof that uh, cos cosh squared minus sinh squared equals 1. It's true. Not not a no big idea in the proof. It's just a bunch of rewriting things and simplifying or whatever. All right, this is the formula for cinch and cosh. And this this one I will say you should have rememberized. Right, this is the analogous formula to sine squared plus cosine squared equals one, but this it's different. It's a minus there. Um, and this actually this formula here is why they are called hyperbolic uh, cinch and cosh. Like that, that word hyperbolic, let's talk about that word hyperbolic. Hyperbolic trig functions. Why are they called hyperbolic? Um, they do have something to do with the, the shape of a hyperbola. That's why they're called hyperbolic. Um, what what is the connection exactly between these functions and a hyperbola? First, let me tell you, the ordinary sine and cosine actually they have a sh sort of shape name to them. Also, they are if you want to contrast them with the hyperbolics, the regular sine x and cosine x are called. They're usually not called this because everybody knows what they are. But if you're trying to uh, trying to contrast them with the hyperbolics. These are called the circular uh, trig functions versus the hyperbolic trig functions. You know, you, we usually don't call them circular, but um, if you're trying to contrast them with the hyperbolics. Um, sine and cosine are called the circular trig functions. Why is that? It's because if you look, this is a fact, that's supposed to be the unit circle. It's a little, a little off center. The unit circle here, right? If you look at any point um, where this angle here is x, then the coordinates of this point are cosine x comma sine x. This is a true fact about the unit circle. Um, why is that true? It's because, uh, so the unit circle has um, 
coordinates given by uh, sine and cosine. Well, really, it's co the cosine is the x coordinate. And why is that true? It's really this is true because uh, of this property, sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1. And this is really the Pythagorean theorem in disguise. Because sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1, it means that the uh, if you use sine and cosine as the x and y coordinates of a point, their squares will always add up to 1, which means that those points will always lie on the unit circle. This is something probably your, uh, your um, calculus teachers in the past encouraged you to think in this way, at least sometimes. We usually don't think of them as uh, in, this, in this way, but um, this point of view actually will come up uh, again in your, uh, in your Calc 3 class. Can you believe it? Um, cosine and sine give the coordinates of the unit circle. It is a true fact, and the reason why it's true is because of this formula. All right. What do you get when you consider cinch and kosh, but from the same point of view? So what about, the question is, what shape has coordinates given by cinch and kosh instead of sine and cosine? Perhaps you can guess the answer. It is a hyperbola. Um, that's because uh, be sorry, when I wrote this Pythagorean theorem, I hope you I miss I meant this. A squared plus B squared equals C squared, right? That's the Pythagorean theorem. Not plus an another plus doesn't make sense there. Equals that's the Pythagorean theorem. It is also the um, the equation of a unit circle, right? A squared plus b squared equals one. This is the uh, equation. Usually we write it with x is x squared plus y squared equals one. That's the equation of the unit circle. Okay. What about if we use cinch and cosh instead of sine and cosine? Well, the proper formula, as we just wrote, is this: cosh squared of x minus cinch squared of x equals one. This corresponds not to the Pythagorean theorem, which is for triangles, but it, there's another theorem that, that is really nobody really talks about, but it, it has to do with the points on a hyperbola. So the points on a hyperbola obey this formula, a squared minus b squared equals 1. This is, a, this is what the equation of a hyperbola is. You know, usually it would be written as x squared minus y squared equals 1. Uh, I'm already using x for something else above. But this, this shape is a hyperbola, which looks like, um, uh, depending on which coordinate you're subtracting, a hyperbola looks like this. If you subtract x squared minus y squared, it looks like this. This is the hyperbola, x squared minus y squared equals 1. And it is a true fact, the unit circle has coordinates given by cosine and sine. If you look at this, the coordinates here on this curve, if you take, say, a, a particular point here, its coordinates can be written as cosh x comma cinch x. And so the coordinates on the curve of a hyperbola are given by cinch and cosh. And that's why these are called hyperbolic functions, because they describe the coordinates of a point on a hyperbola, whereas the ordinary sine and cosine, they describe the coordinates of a point on a circle. And that's why they're called the circular trig functions, even though we usually don't say that. Um, the coordinates on the curve of a hyperbola are given by cosh x comma cinch x. All right. And if you do it the other way around, cinch x comma cosh x, you get you get this other hyperbola up here, which um, we don't, I mean, you can do it either way if you want. You get different, slightly different hyperbolas. Okay, that's why when your friends ask you, why is that called hyperbolic? It's because these functions describe the coordinates of the uh, points on a hyperbola. 
All right. Any questions about that? This is why the word hyperbolic is used. All right. Excellent. Um, by the way, I will mention, you can do this with other types of shapes if you want. Um, just draw another shape and then ask yourself what functions describe the points on this shape. There is, some, there is such a thing as elliptic functions, um, which come from looking at uh, points on an ellipse and, and other, other things. They become increasingly obscure. You know, sine and cosine are useful for many, many things, not just for points on the unit circle. Um, these other weirder functions are less, less generally useful, so we don't talk about them as much. All right. One last thing I want to say about the hyperbolic functions is we should talk at least briefly about their derivatives. So the derivatives of cinch and cosh. All right, everybody knows, I will just refresh our memory. For ordinary sine and cosine, the derivative of sine is cosine, and the derivative of uh, cosine x is minus sine of x. Um, maybe I'll give you guys a chance, you folks, um, see if you can work out the appropriate formulas for the derivatives of cinch and cosh. Maybe I'll, uh, let's do the cinch together. And then you you can all try to do the cosh. What you have to do, so for cinch, you have to um, use the definition of cinch, right? These actually, these formulas to prove these for sine and cosine is not easy at all, just because there is not a convenient formula for sine that you can take the derivative of. But there is a fairly workable formula for cinch that we can simply take the derivative of. So. We're going to do the derivative of e to the x minus e to the minus x divided by 2, right? Now, that's a fraction inside the parentheses, which suggests that maybe I'm going to have to do the quotient rule. But actually, you don't need to do the quotient rule because it's a constant in the denominator. That means I can think of the, the dividing by 2 instead as multiplying times a half. And then you can just factor that outside the uh, derivative. So this is the same as 1 half derivative of e to the x minus e to the minus x. And that we can fairly uh, easily take those derivatives, right? So we got 1 half. What do you say? What's the derivative of e to the x? e to the x. Yes. Thank you. Minus, and now I go derivative of e to the minus x. What's the derivative of e to the minus x? Wouldn't that be e to the x plus e to the x because You should chain rule that. Uh, it's not plus when you do the chain rule. It's um, you multiply when you do the chain rule, right? Yes, oh, or, oh, you were you were reading this part again, right? Sorry, yeah. I thought you were telling me the whole answer. Yeah. So what you said is just right. You get e to the minus x again, and then you got to do times the derivative of the inside of the exponent, which is negative one, which I think is what you we're saying, and I yeah, and misunderstood. The... Yeah, and then the minus signs will combine. So this is 1 half e to the x plus e to the minus x, right? Is that anything? We're going to call that cosh. That is cosh. Yeah, excellent. Cosh of x. Great. So, did that, did that surprise anybody? Probably not. This, this is the formula for the derivative of sine. You get cosine and... Surprising no one, the derivative of cinch ends up being cosh. All right, let's see. Can we do the same for cosine? How about, uh, I'll, I'll have you guys uh, work this one out. Derivative of cos uh, cosh x. Do basically the same thing and see, uh, see what comes out at the end. I'll give you a moment, see how it goes. Sometimes people ask me, are there going to be proofs on the test? Because we do proofs of things sometimes in class. I would say something... My answer is maybe, um, but if, if I ask you to prove something on the test, it will be at the level of what I just asked you to do right now, which is to say, basically, you plug stuff in, simplify things, and you get some answer. I hope you don't feel like that's too onerous.
I'm doing it slowly on my screen. So look away if you don't want spoilers. How we doing? Anybody agree with me so far? I hope you agree with me so far. Doing more or less exactly the same stuff. Plug the formula in, factor the one half out as before, and then you can take the derivative. Uh, derivative of e to the x is e to the x. Derivative of e to the minus x, what do you say? Somebody else want to shout it out? Maybe one of the Johns. Can I get a John in here? You guys got to stick together. It's a crazy world out there. The mean streets of Fairfield. And am I Johns actually there? Yeah, I'm just, I didn't get that far with this. Okay. One. Would it be similar to the cinch where it'd be like, um, e to the negative x times, for the chain rule, like times x? Uh, times negative 1. It's the same, the same thing uh, as we did uh, up here. Thank you, John. Um, it's, this minus 1 comes because you have to, you, you take the same thing again because it's a e to some power, and then you have to multiply times the derivative of the inside of the exponent. The derivative of minus x is negative 1. Great. Uh, so, if you were to rewrite this, it says 1 half e to the x minus e to the negative x. And what is that? Is that anything? We call that one cinch. Yeah, this is the, the shocking conclusion. Derivative of cosh is cinch. It is actually slightly shocking because I don't know what you were expecting. Were you expecting... Um, negative cinch. It's not negative. It's positive cinch. This is slightly weird, but uh, so to conclude, derivative of cinch is cosh. Derivative of cosh is cinch. No minus, right? That's a uh, that I'm, to me at least is slightly surprising, but it's a true fact. Derivative of cinch is cosh, and the derivative of cosh is cinch, not minus cinch. Strange but true, all right? That means, of course, we get integral formulas that correspond to these. So, integral of cosh x dx is cinch x plus c. Oops. Cinch x plus c. And the integral of cinch x dx is cosh x plus c. I suppose these are slightly easier to deal with than sine and cosine because you don't have to get yourself confused about when you have the minus uh, and when you don't because you there's no minus, right? You just get the one gives you the other one, all right? Any thoughts about that? Questions about that? Cinch and cosh, they're derivatives and integrals. They work out just fine. Uh, of course, you know, you can do more more complicated uh, examples which involve chain rules. So could I do, say, derivative of cinch of, you know, square root of 3x plus 2? This would, e you have to do the chain rule in this case. So first of all, handling the cinch on the outside, the cinch becomes a cosh. So this becomes cosh of the same thing. 
And then I do the chain rule, multiply times the derivative of the thing on the inside. The thing on the inside, writing in a more helpful way, is this, right? It's writing it with a negative exponent. And so when I'm uh, when I do the chain rule, I have to multiply times the derivative of that red thing. The derivative of the red thing, you do the chain rule again. So this will be one half three x plus two to the minus a half, and then times the derivative of the very in inside of uh, the uh, square root, which is 3x plus 2, the derivative of that is 3. So this would be the full thing here, the derivative of cinch of that other thing. All right. And you can have some, some practice with these on the homework. I don't think we need to go to many, many examples because they're really the same as the ordinary chain rule. And you can do, you know, u substitutions inside those integrals too. Again, I don't think we need to go through a million examples. All right, any any uh, thoughts about those? Questions about those? This is one way in which the cinch and cosh act a little nicer than the the sine and cosine, um, just a little nicer. All right. One last thing, and then we're going to move on to something completely different. Um, this is basically all I wanted to say about cinch and cosh. I will just say, for your information, we're not going to talk about this, but um, there are inverse hyperbolic... They are called, you know, inverse cinch, inverse cosh, etc. All right? the way you would find those inverses is by inverting pieces of the original function. Now, actually, cinch itself is one-to-one, -one, so you don't even have to take a piece of cinch. You can just straight up, like, cinch actually has a real inverse because it's a one-to-one -one function. Cosh does not because cosh has, is not one-to-one, -one, so you have to take a piece of it. Um, and there's inverses for tanch and all the, all the other ones. Um, and those also have formulas for their derivatives. These are in the book, but for our purposes, these are so obscure that uh, it's not going to come up uh, again in, in this class. So we don't have to... Uh, I'm not going to worry about the inverse hyperbolic trig functions. But you can talk about them if you want. They do exist. All right? And this is all I want to say about hyperbolic trig functions. Anybody have any thoughts or questions about them? They are sometimes useful, far less useful, I would say, than ordinary sine and cosine. They come up all the time. Uh, cinch and cosh, much, a much more uh, niche, more hipster type functions, right? All right, excellent. That will do it for whatever this section in the book is, 6.7, I believe. Um, there's one more section in chapter six that this is something that perhaps uh, you have learned. You know, some people do this in their, uh, in, um, I, I, I can remember very vaguely learning about this in high school. So if you had a good high school uh, calculus class, you may have learned this. I want to talk about something called indeterminate forms and a very fancy rule called L'Hopital's Rule. This is a French mathematician's name, L'Hopital's Rule. Sometimes this is written as like this with a little circumflex. Um, I believe the, the, uh, um, the spelling is, this is a French guy, um, this Apparently, in modern French, it's usually written this way, but the this French accent, I believe, um, is is like an invention of the past two hundred years or so. Like the, this, when this guy actually lived, he wrote his own name this way without the accent. He spelled it like L Hospital. Um, this is L'Hopital's rule, and actually, L'Hopital's rule was not discovered by L'Hopital. It was discovered by Bernoulli. One of the Ber there are two famous Bernoullis. One of the Bernoullis discovered L'Hopital's rule, but um, for some reason L'Hopital wrote something about it, and he ended up getting the historical credit, even though it's not actually his invention. Anyway, what uh, L'Hopital's rule is um, used? So it's a trick 
for finding the limit of something, usually uh, the limit of a fraction, where you get 0 over 0 when you try to plug in. Uh, what I mean by that is if you have to do something like... So here's a true story. I actually um, I just gave a test to my Calc 1 class on, on Friday before the weekend. This was a question which appeared on the Calc 1 test. Um, if I have the limit of x squared plus 2x minus 3 divided by x squared minus 3x plus 2, how do you find the limit of something that looks like that? Um, well, if you don't know L'Hopital's rule, so let's let's talk about how would you do this limit without L'Hopital's rule. Um, you would try to plug this number in to the to the function, as you always do, to find the limit. You try to plug the number in, and if you actually get some answer, then that is the answer. What happens if I try to plug in? Uh, I'm plugging x equal 1. I get 1 squared plus 2 times 1 minus 3 divided by 1 squared minus 3 times 1 plus 2. This is 1 plus 2 minus 3 over 1 minus 3 plus 2. This is 0 over 0. And I hope you remember from your youth when you did this, when you see 0 over 0, this does not mean that the answer is 0 or it doesn't cancel and give you 1. It also doesn't mean the limit does not exist. When you see 0 over 0, this gives no information about what the limit is. It may be that the limit equals 0, or maybe the limit does not exist, or maybe the limit really does equal 1 or some other number. And actually, when you see 0 over 0, that cannot tell you what the limit is. And um, you were hopefully told by your calculus teacher or whatever, if you see 0 over 0, you've got to go back to the beginning, factor and cancel somehow. You need to simplify. This 0 over 0 tells you no information. Actually, this is called fancy terminology an indeterminate indeterminate form indeterminate form that is when you see 0 over 0 this does not help you determine what the limit is it is an indeterminate form why is the word form used i'm not sure exactly why it's called a form i think probably because it's not even um, it's not even a number. Like it looks like zero over zero, which looks like a number, but of course zero over zero is not a number. It's a, I mean, it's a thing. You can write it down on a piece of paper. They won't they won't arrest you, but um, it's not a number. It's I guess it's a form. It's an indeterminate form. Uh, anyway, when you see an indeterminate form, what you have to do is go back to the beginning and somehow simplify. Um, so that you, and then try to plug in again so that you won't get 0 over 0. And the way to simplify in this example is to factor. So this is the same as uh, you factor on the top and on the bottom. In this case, I would get x minus, uh, x plus 3, x minus 1, I believe. And on the bottom, I would get x minus 2 and x minus 1, right? When I gave this question on my Calc 1 test on Friday, this is what they all did, the good ones at least. Um, and then having factored like this, you can cancel the common factor on top and the bottom as uh, x minus 1, right? Those cancel. The bad ones would have done something like cancel the x squareds at the very beginning. That's bogus. You can't do that, buddy. Um, that's not how we cancel in this house. We cancel by factoring and then canceling. Uh, you, you have to cancel things which are being multiplied, not being added. Anyway, now that those are canceled, we can actually plug the number in, and actually we will get a real answer this time. It says 1 plus 3 over 1 minus 2. This is 4 over negative 1. Negative 4. This is the real answer. All right. So the 0 over 0 was just a red herring. Um, it didn't tell us anything. We had to go back, simplify, and eventually get some legitimate answer. All right. Negative 4. L'Hopital's rule is a trick for circumventing this procedure whereby you go back to the beginning and factor instead. So L'Hopital's rule 
is meant to handle the same situation. L hospital handles this same situation, but differently. And it's kind of a magical trick, in my opinion. Um, I'll, I'll just tell you uh, how to do it first, and then we will we'll have to discuss um, why why it works, uh, which is a which is a um, different question. But here's how you do it. Um, if we get zero over zero when you plug in on the top and then the bottom, so if we have something like lim x goes to a of something on top over something on the bottom, right? If you're trying to do this and you plug the number in and you get zero over zero, so if we have this and it so happens that the limit on the top, f of uh, x equals zero, and also the limit on the bottom, g of x equals zero. If when you try to plug it in, you get zero on the top and on the bottom, then there's a formula for what the limit is. Then, so all of this is to say, in, in uh, more sort of ordinary language, when we plug in, we get zero over zero, right? That's really what I'm saying here is if you're looking at a limit of a fraction and when you try to take the limit on the top and on the bottom, you get zero both times, then this is the formula for L'Hopital's rule. The limit of f of x over g of x is equal to the limit of f prime of x over g prime of x. This is L'Hopital's rule. All right. It says when you're doing that limit, if you get 0 over 0, you can instead do the limit of the derivative on top and the derivative on the bottom. And that will be the correct answer. All right. Very weird. Um, one thing to notice is, uh, you know, when you take the derivative of a fraction, you get, you don't get this, right? You get something much more complicated because you have to use the quotient rule. Um, am I now saying, hey, you don't have to do the quotient rule anymore. You can just do the derivative on the top of the bottom. No, that's not what I'm saying. Because this is about what is the limit of a fraction. It's not about the derivative of a fraction. But it turns out the limit of a fraction, in the case when you get 0 over 0, the limit of the fraction is the same as the limit of the fraction of derivatives. Very strange. Um, can we just try that out for the example that I did above, that my calculus students did? It was lim x goes to 1 of x squared. I forgot what it was. x squared plus 2x minus 3. Oh, I have it written on my paper here. x squared plus 2x minus 3 over x squared minus 3x plus 2. All right. So... If you know L'Hopital's rule, here's how you do this problem. First of all, you should still try to plug it in. And you will realize that you get, you know, 1 squared plus 2 minus 3 over 1 squared minus 3 plus 2, which is 0 over 0. This means you have permission to do the L'Hopital's rule. Remember, L'Hopital's rule, it only works if when you plug in you get 0 over 0. So you have to verify, first of all, that you get 0 over 0. If you don't get 0 over 0, then actually you don't have to do anything else because whatever you get is the answer, so you'll be done. If you get 0 over 0, now we can use L'Hopital's rule. And this is the step in which I'm doing the L'Hopital's rule. I take the derivative of the top function and also the derivative of the bottom function. So up top, it becomes 2x plus 2. On the bottom, it becomes 2x minus 3. All right, and that step, so this equal sign, maybe I'll put a little, a little h on there just to remind you, that was doing L'Hopital's rule, all right? That step, I took the derivative on the top and also took the derivative on the bottom. And now we can evaluate the limit by plugging in because it's a lot simpler now. We evaluate by plugging in, and what I get when I plug in... Oh my goodness, me. Whoa, oh my sorry. Goodness, me. I just got a phone call. That was my ringtone. Um... A little audio clip from a certain uh, game entitled Cooking Mama. You into Cooking Mama? That was a, that was a Cooking Mama uh, ringtone. Um, I made it myself. I didn't pay money for the Cooking Mama ringtone. My kids think it's funny. Uh, and I kind of think it's funny too. I'm not ashamed. Um, when I plug in x equal 1 here, I get 2 times 1 plus 2 
over 2 times 1 minus 3. What This is 2 plus 2 over 2 minus 3, which is 4 over negative 1, which is negative 4. And that's the same answer that we got the first time around. All right. Doing L'Hopital's rule. This is how you do it. It is a way to avoid going back and factoring. Um, now, in this particular example, going back and factoring was not all that it's not all that bad to do it the other way. You know, L'Hopital's rule in this case is not obviously better than just doing it um, the other way that my Calculus 1 students did it. Um, I will, I will uh, like to point out that this is pretty mysterious. Um, the fact that we ended up getting the same answer here, negative 4. But if you look at this, the individual steps are totally different. And in fact, look at this. When I, In the first part, I hope you can still see this. The first time we did this, when we factored right here, we ended up with this, x plus 3 over x minus 2, which is not the same as this. They're totally different. Um, now, we got, we end up with the same answer, but what? there's no, like it seems to me, there's no obvious connection between the two procedures that we did here. There's no, no clear reason why you should say, oh yeah, what we did up here, it's really the same thing is happening down here. Actually, to me, it looks like, two completely different things which are happening that that kind of magically give you the same answer. But this is part of the character of L'Hopital's rule. It is kind of a magical fact. The reason that it works is not at all obvious. Um, it is a, an alternative way to solve this other problem, but really the, the method is, is very different, even though you do end up with the, the same answer. Um, this is not just about avoiding factoring though, right? In this example, the L'Hopital's rule can be used to avoid factoring at the beginning. But actually, L'Hopital's rule sometimes is the only way you can do it. So let's try, here's another example. How about lim x goes to zero, sine x over x, all right? This one, again, even though I intend to use L'Hopital's rule because you know that's what I'm talking about right now, but you should start by just trying to plug the value in. Um, when I try to plug in, this becomes sine of 0 divided by 0, which is 0 over 0. So this is the indeterminate form, which means I can use L'Hopital's rule. But let, let's just think about, um, what if you didn't know L'Hopital's rule? The, uh, the thing which I would tell my Calc 1 students is, go back to the beginning and try to factor. But of course, there's nothing here that you can factor. There's no way to simplify this at all, right? You can't rewrite sine of x in some other form which allows you to cancel those x's. So in this example, L'Hopital's rule is really your only option. There is no other way to um, to work this out, uh, at least not not in a simple way. That by actually doing some weird trigonometry, you can do it, but I'm not into that, at least not right now. Anyway, I'm doing the L'Hopital's rule here. It ends up looking like lim x goes to zero, and then I take the derivative on the top and the bottom derivative of sine x is cosine x. On the bottom, derivative of x is 1. And now, we can try to plug it in. And this time, we actually get some answer. We get cosine 0 over 1. Cosine of 0 is 1, so this is 1. So the limit equals 1, all right? So this is one in which L'Hopital's rule is not just uh, convenience, but it is necessary in order to do that one, at least without getting into some serious uh, trigonometry. All right, any thoughts about that? All right, we got about five minutes, but I think maybe I'm gonna stop there if that's all right with everybody. So we will resume, I suppose, a week from today uh, and and do some more with uh, L'Hopital's rule. Tomorrow, we're just gonna talk about review for the test. So um, what I plan to do in terms of this review for the test tomorrow, I will make up a, a cute little review sheet with some you know, topics and maybe practice problems, uh, but I'm not gonna prepare a bunch, of, uh, a bunch of stuff to do during class. So I hope that you will all come with questions. If you don't have questions, then I'll just try and you know, make up examples for us to, to work through. But hopefully, um, bring your questions tomorrow and we will answer all the questions. All right, 